I think it's all very well to say that people shouldn't be for, faced with a choice between being in lockdown or using a health passport. But the reality is that's the choice we have. It, it's the authoritarian dream. I mean, if you can treat populations like cattle. So today is a bit of an innovation for us. We are trying our first debate format. Uh, last week, we put out a video with Lord Jonathan Sumption um, talking all about lockdown and the pros and cons of that. And we're quite taken aback by the response. A lot of people were really upset that he appeared to condone or be comfortable with the idea of vaccine passports. So we thought, let's investigate this issue. Let's try to get to the bottom of it. Why is it that people are so upset and what might be the merits of it? So we're happy to say we've got two really qualified and expert spokespeople on either side of this vaccine passports debate. So first of all, Kirsty Inners, you are the director of digital governance at the Tony Blair Institute for Global Change. Hopefully I got that right. More or less. Um, and Head of digital government at Tony Blair Institute. And Silky Carlo, you are director of Big Brother Watch, the uh, civil liberties organisation based here in the UK. Hi. So let's just kick straight off. Kirsty, what is a vaccine passport? I know in your parlance you call them digital health passports. What are they and why would we want one? Sure. So a health passport or a health pass is a way for a citizen to prove something about their health status to a third party. So for instance, a way to show someone that you have had either a vaccine or a recent negative test and therefore you're at a lower risk of transmitting COVID and that means that um, for a range of settings, you might be um, less of a risk, so uh, more um, more able to enter settings like, for instance, a care home where there's a vulnerable population that you want to protect, or a situation where you might have a big group of people in an enclosed environment. And there might be something that could be really helpful for us to manage the risk as we come out of a lockdown. After a year of having our civil liberties grossly constrained by lockdown. We're about to see this lifted in the summer, but even on 21st of June, not everyone will be vaccinated. And we know that it'll take a couple of years after that for everyone in the world to be vaccinated. And so at that point, um, we're at risk of seeing an uptick in transmission of COVID. We've heard a warning from Chris Whitty about that in the past week. And put, putting in place something like a health pass might be a way to help manage the risk in certain settings in society. So just to be clear then, you're, you're not talking about a vaccine passport as a mode of international travel only. It would actually be used domestically for what kind of environments? Are we talking about going to the gym and going to restaurants and pubs? How would it actually work inside the country? I think it looks now completely certain that we will need something like that to travel internationally because um, most countries have now put some kind of limits on or conditions on who can enter. Uh, so we will need a system that works internationally. But we'd argue that there's also potentially a role for them within countries, not in every setting, of course, but in some, as I mentioned, there'll be some places like care homes where it's there's a clear justification for trying to protect the people that are in that setting and their entrance is already regulated. Um, having to prove something about yourself to go in isn't such a big deal. There'll be some settings where um, it might make sense to say that there should never be a requirement to prove your health. Um, status. So maybe A&E or GP surgeries, you wouldn't want to restrict anyone's access to those settings. And there'll be a load in between where it might be up to the setting themselves. So for instance, if you're a pub owner, there'll be plenty of pub owners that won't want to do that. But there might well be some who want to offer their customers the reassurance that if they come into the pub, it's a confined space, um, they are as safe as they possibly can be um, from being at risk of being exposed to COVID. And how would they work in, in terms of practicality, are we talking about a paper thing or are we talking about something on your on your phone that you have to do? Are they going to scan your eyeball? What are you what are you planning? One way they could work is a QR code on your phone. So on entering a setting, say you're going to a football match or a cinema, you scan your QR code and it comes up with, say, a green or a red indicator or a tick or a cross to show that yes you've had either a vaccine or a recent negative test so good to go. Um, we can do that in a way that's perfectly privacy protecting so the person that's letting you into the football stadium doesn't need to see anything else about you, they don't need to see your um, 
kind of vaccine that you've had, your date of birth, even your name. Um, so it would be a way to share that information in a way that's secure and verifiable, but much more privacy protecting and much more secure than, for instance, um, having to produce your vaccine card that you get given at the moment when you're vaccinated. OK, uh, Silky Carlo, director of Big Brother Watch. You've heard the plan there, QR codes on telephones for entering football stadiums and the like. What's your problem with that? It's it's pretty alarming to hear policy suggestions like this. And I know a lot of people are feeling really alarmed to hear um, this being taken even semi seriously. Um, this 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 envisages a kind of segre segregated surveillance society for the future that would be, I think, unnecessary, but also divisive, discriminatory and wrong. Um, the, an important thing to consider here in the first instance is, is that there isn't conclusive evidence yet about the impact of vaccinations on transmissibility. But the fact we're even talking about vaccinations just a year into the pandemic is quite remarkable in and of itself. And I think 25 million people now in the UK have received their first dose of a vaccination. So comparatively, we're in a really good position. Um, the most vulnerable people in the country have been vaccinated. Um, and we know that coronavirus obviously is um, is something that that in particular affects those those vulnerable groups um, that that have now been vaccinated. So, so we should be looking at liberalising, opening, um, living our lives again, not introducing a kind of segregated checkpoint society that's been described. So when you say it's segregated, you mean that those people who choose not to have the vaccine will be kept out, essentially. That's the in essence, the, the, the whole purpose of a, of a vaccination passport is to divide societies along that line. And, you know, bear in mind that it's, it's I'd say, easy to have this conversation in the UK. It's really not, actually. It's quite chilling. But um, to think about this internationally as well, um, millions of people around the world aren't going to have access to vaccinations. I don't think they should be cut out forever. I don't think um, that there, there's a very strong case to do that. I think we're going to want to see family reunions. We're going to want to see people being able to travel. Now, of course, the alternative being put forward is that um, you can have a, a coronavirus test a, as an alternative. Um, we have some, some precedent on this now because, of course, mass testing is being used to reopen schools. And it's a problem because infection rates are quite low. And there is a 0.1 false positive rate with uh, the lateral flow tests, the rapid tests that are being used, which might not sound like a lot. But when you're testing millions of people frequently and the true infection rates are low, that means you're going to be generating a lot of false positives. And then we're going to go back in circles, locking down, causing panics um, wrongly. And, and in fact, quite aside from the national impact, even if it means for one family, that they have to miss out on work wrongly, or the child has to miss out on education. I mean, the, 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 the impact of that is quite serious. So I think if, if we were having this conversation where there weren't vaccinations, where we're dealing with high fatality disease that we were in the height of, um, you might start to think about something like mass testing using effective tests as a way to reopen parts of the economy. This is a million miles from that. This is more towards it's a it's a really big step towards mandatory vaccines. Let, let's be honest. It's not just me saying that. I mean, many parliamentarians said that in in the debate this week um, that this is coercive. So would you actually go further in the other direction, Silky, and and outlaw places like pubs, theatres, airlines from introducing a scheme like this? I think that existing law makes it very hard for private companies to try to discriminate, certainly to discriminate on the basis of vaccination, um, because in particular, there are groups who, who either can't access or won't be able to take or, or who choose not to have a, a vaccination. For example, pregnant women. Um, and um, the alternative being a test, well, <laughs> again, look at what's happened in schools. I mean, you, you you cannot force someone to have a, a, a medical test at the moment in, in British law in order to, to enjoy a fundamental right like the right to education. And that's why the tests have been advisory. And there's been mass uptake, obviously, um, but it hasn't been, been mandatory. But I would go a step 
um, further. I do think the government should go a step further and make it crystal clear that in everyday domestic settings, you, you, you cannot use vaccination status for access control. That would turn us into quite a grotesque, divisive and discriminatory checkpoint society that, that is just nothing, nothing like the vision of, of Britain that any, any rational person has. Kirsty, what do you say to those objections then? I mean, is, it, is your plan going to take us towards a, a checkpoint society? Do you understand why so many people feel hesitant and worried about it? I can completely understand people being worried about discriminating between people that have had a vaccine and people that haven't, because not everyone's been offered it. And as you say, Silky, many people or some people won't take it up. Um, latest figures, I think about 80% of UK people are intending to have the vaccine when they can do. Um, so that's why we argue that you should integrate testing status as well. So everybody should be able to use the health pass if we're going to have one. There should be nobody that's excluded from any setting on the basis of their health status. As to whether this takes us towards a mandatory... Can I just ask, what, what does that mean though? So if I'm not vaccinated, that means I would then pay for a private test three days before going to a football match? I mean, they're quite expensive, aren't they? Is that, a, is that a, re a feasible way for people to live? Well, that's how it looks at the moment. But I think you need to make testing available to the majority of the population the majority of the time. And tests are getting more accurate and cheaper and more widely available all the time. And I think that's going to be a feature of our life as we come out of this pandemic for the foreseeable future, unfortunately. But to the, those people who aren't vaccinated, their life is going to be a lot of testing then, basically. If they want to go to the pub on Friday, they need to be tested sometime on Wednesday. And if they have a concert on the following Tuesday, they need to be tested again on the weekend. Is that actually the offer to the non-vaccinated cohort in society? Yeah, and I don't think that's such a big price to pay for being able to lift the restrictions that we're facing at the moment. At the moment, nobody can go to any football matches or any concerts whatsoever. So being able to open up society again with some degree of reassurance that we've got um, a hold on what a level of coronavirus is being transmitted amongst the population is well worth it, I think. Because what was interesting, Kirsty, in your paper that I read is that you actually see this as a kind of a way out of lockdowns and a way of restoring liberty. And that was quite a sort of interesting take that actually what was tyrannical about lockdowns was their universal sort of one size fits all mentality and that if people are able to show that they're in different situations, they should be able to have different rules. Is, is that how you see it? Yeah, that's right. I think lockdowns are an incredibly blunt instrument. So at the moment, everybody is subject to some absolutely appalling restrictions on our freedom for good reason. But being legally prohibited from socialising, going to work, travelling, that's a you know, that's a terrible way to live. And we've all suffered immense damage over the past year to the economy, to society. Children have lost at half a year's worth of schooling or more. We can't have that situation going on. And if we're going to uh, be at risk of having a third wave, as we may be, or if there's going to be variants of COVID coming up, or even if there may be another pandemic that we don't know about yet around the corner, we need to be much smarter next time. We can't spend a year in lockdown the way we just have. Silky, what do you say to that? I mean, it reminds me of something that Lord Sumption said in our interview, actually, which is that, yes, it, it's regrettable that we should need these vaccine passports, but at least it's better than everybody being locked in their homes. What do you say to the argument that it's actually a way of restoring freedoms to people and that if it's going to happen anyway, better that it's done well? Well, this is the narrative of authoritarianism. And this is how the authoritarian grip closes in. What we're being presented with here is an ultimatum between whether you want to live under house arrest or whether you'd like to live on tag. And most prisoners would probably rather live on tag. But the question is, why is it necessary? What's the balance between the benefits or the perceived benefits and the risks? And I don't think that case has been made. And in fact, the World Health Organization isn't even recommending at the moment that vaccination status is used as a condition for travel. We still don't have the conclusive evidence on transmissibility. So I think let, let's make no mistake. Um, there are ideological reasons that some people will promote this idea. There are certainly commercial reasons that some people will promote this idea. What is the agenda, do you think? What, why are people keen to push this kind of thing if it's not just the practical reasons that Kirsty set out? 
Well, I, you know, I've been working on um, surveillance and civil liberties for many, many years, and there there has been a um, long uh, push towards biometric control systems, for example, at borders, and then increasing borders domestically. So, for example, you know, we now see things like police officers have fingerprint scanners. Uh, we're starting to see the creep of facial recognition, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so, yeah, there is a big, there is a big kind of policy and commercial interest in uh but what's what's uh, the ideological and what's the commercial interest w what are those people why are they pushing those things it, it's the authoritarian dream i mean if you can treat populations like cattle which i'm sorry to say is, is really what va vaccination passports are the most grotesque example of that i've, I've ever heard um that we kind of have biological risk scores we're treated like biohazards um we have to have a green tick to to enjoy the country that we live in and, and were born in um and and yes it can make things quicker so you know we, you hear often with biometric access systems things like seamless smart um the idea that you can you can move freely because you're being surveilled because there's this kind of biometric data capture um, and you can have this kind of total control, quantifiability, uh, uh, omniscience ab about people's health status, for example. Yeah, if you were if you were um, if you were operating a totalitarian government, uh, these would be very good things to have. If you're a farmer looking after a herd of cattle, they'd be very good things to have. Um, but <laughs> that's not the kind of future that we need to ha that that I think we want. Uh, certainly not the future that I want. What about the commercial point? I just want to push this home because I haven't heard yet. I mean, because you hear a lot of this on the internet, that there are kind of forces at large that are pushing this for some kind of cynical commercial motive, whether it's Big Pharma or, you know, whoever in Silicon Valley. Do you believe that? Do you think that there is a kind of alter ulterior motive going on here? No, I don't think, I don't think it's as black and, and white as that at all. But as I say, working in, in the field of surveillance and, and biometrics and civil liberties for some time, um, these companies are constantly trying to sell their products. And so they try to um, present silver bullet solutions to problems, whether they exist or not sometimes, um, or certainly will try to um, up the perception of a problem. Now, let's you know be clear on this. We're in the middle of a pandemic. We've got a massive problem um, and we need some really extraordinary solutions. And um, we, we, well, we need some extraordinary measures to, to try to get towards solutions. And we've definitely seen that over the last year for, you know, some right, some wrong. Um, but yes, it's no surprise that, of course, some um, commercial vendors will try to sell um, both vaccinations and vaccination passports as being the silver bullet solution. I don't think that's the case. And, and the problem, the fact that we don't have conclusive evidence about transmissibility at the moment also, you know, shows that that's, that, that, that's really the case. As it stands, even if you'd had a vaccination, if you were gonna try to create this um, completely kind of sanitized um, environment, you would need to be testing everyone, even if they'd been vaccinated as well. Um, so that's why I think, because these kinds of discussions aren't happening, Yes, I think there are some ideological and, and, and commercial motives that are certainly not behind this, that don't get me wrong, but that are wrapped up in the kind of narrative and, and rhetoric around it. I mean, it's the, the aviation industry is one of the biggest promoters of this. And I know it was Tony Blair said that that's where he was going to have a real push. Um, you know, they are not elected. They, they don't get to make these decisions. Um, Kirsty, let's see what you say to that. You work for the Tony Blair Institute. Yep. You know that the internet is full of what people call conspiracies or, or theories about um, organizations like the World Economic Forum, characters like Bill Gates. There's the whole sense that basically the kind of powerful elites have designed a system for our future that makes life easier to govern and has certain commercial advantages, which people intuitively don't want. Is that true? No, I don't think it is. I think it's all very well to say that people shouldn't be for, faced with a choice between being in lockdown or using a health passport. But the reality is that's the choice we have as a result of coronavirus. That's nobody's fault. And when it comes to who's making the argument for us to be able to uh, travel internationally again, 
of course the airline industry is pushing for that that's in their economic interest but people want to go on holiday people want to visit their families people want to be able to go and do their jobs and i think that's completely reasonable do you understand why there are these objections and and why people do associate this drive with that kind of global elite do you have you picked up on that and and do you understand why that's happened i don't see any link between health passports and some perceived global elite i think that as i say if you do get the design right and that means including testing status and making sure that there's a way for people who don't have a smartphone and don't have that kind of tech to use it as well health passes can be completely inclusive and completely democratic and can be um, a way to enable people to get back to their lives at the moment there's huge inequity because people who are vulnerable or at risk are unable to go out and do their jobs or or you know return to life and even after lockdown restrictions end a lot of people will understandably be nervous about going back into those kind of environments and having a way to reduce the risk if a health pass is a tool that can reduce the number of people that get sick and die from covid then i don't see why we wouldn't explore that do you think they'd be permanent or temporary kirsty i think you would want them to be temporary it's you know covid like silky said we've taken a lot of exceptional measures to deal with covid because of how infectious it is because of how deadly it is and because we don't understand the long term effects yet and um, i think you would want to make sure that it was absolutely clear in the legislation and the regulation around a health pass that it's to deal with the current coronavirus pandemic and how much how much confidence do you have in that though i mean if it's this wonderful efficient system that these companies are finding so great can you really see them trashing that technology and winding it all back in years to come? I think it's got to be something that's regulated. So this is going to crop up and start happening as soon as lockdown starts to lift. We've already heard some employers saying that they want their employees to be vaccinated. We've heard some companies, uh, Saga Cruises, wants all its passengers to be vaccinated. So once you've got that requirement for people to prove something about their status, you need a way for them to prove it. So it's going to start happening. I think there will be legal disputes about how and where that can happen. And government will probably need to put some rules around it to provide a bit of clarity, a bit of certainty. And part of that can be making clear that it's limited in its scope and it's limited in its time. So put in place a clear sunset clause for when the use of health passes will be suspended. I don't see why that, that shouldn't be perfectly operable. Silky, do you, do you buy that? No, um, and that's not what I read from the report either, because it said that um, this would be a useful system to have for future waves, for future strains and for future pandemics. And because we're dealing with the coronavirus, um, it does seem quite likely that then um, it would be used for things like serious flu outbreaks um, and, and other kinds of things. I mean, every time we've had a kind of knee jerk authoritarian reaction to um, negative or even tragic events, the 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 solution, um, the the kind of knee jerk response is often it often extends and endures far beyond the initial purpose. I mean, look at um, airport security controls, um, for instance, and the big row that was had over naked body scanners and, and this kind of thing. That's quite a low level example, but um, we are going into different kind of territory now where um, the, the things that are being proposed are more and more and more intrusive and will fundamentally change the way that we live our lives. That's certainly what a vaccine passport would do. And I think it will have a kind of impact on the psyche as well. You know, if we're told this is your this is your freedom pass, this is what you now need to live safely, um, to be able to earn, et cetera, to be able to see friends without worrying about killing them. You know, this this kind of really um, overhyped and quite kind of neurotic um, nar- narrative at a time that should be in the UK, at least a, time, a moment for optimism. You can't then take that away. And I think any kind of half sensible policymaker knows that, because if you take it away, you'll give people a great sense of anxiety. Um, I, it's just never happened before. I mean, that we're still dealing now with post-terror legislation that was passed quite hastily in the post 9-11 years. Um, and if we learn anything from that, it should be not to make extreme reactive policies that change the way that we live. Kirsty, do you, do you see the cynicism a little bit there with the idea that it will be rolled back 
when so many of these measures do stick around? And, and are you also worried about the, just the more intangible psychological impact on the way we live if every time we go into a shop we have to scan a specially generated barcode and see if we get a green tick or a cross? It, it's, it, to a lot of people, it feels dystopian. Mm, about the longevity of the measure, um, I don't think there'll be any problem in restricting it to an emergency situation like we have in dealing with this pandemic. Having a tool available and putting it in, into use are two different things. And we do have a vibrant civil liberties community in this country and we do have a parliamentary democracy. And I think it'd be perfectly possible to constrain the use of something like a health pass to a situation where we are managing an active live pandemic as we are at the moment. And as for the way it would affect the way daily life feels for people, I don't think it will feel particularly intrusive or strange at all. It's, it's swipe of the phone. It feels like making a contactless payment. I think it would um, soon start to feel fairly natural. But it's just important to say again that I don't think it's for all settings. I don't think it needs to be um, pervasive in daily life. It's for settings where we think there's a real justification for making sure that um, we have as much reassurance as we can that everyone inside is at the lowest possible risk of passing on the virus. I mean, that, that makes it even more pointless, doesn't it? Because, and this this is the thing about this this creep towards effectively making, a, a push towards making va vaccinations mandatory. They're not mandatory and tests aren't mandatory. So if you require um, a vaccine pass or a health pass in certain environments it will you're then going to go into other environments where no one has one so it becomes part of a kind of um health surveillance theater um that actually isn't really doing very much and what you'll see then is a ratcheting like what we've seen over the last year you'll see a massive ratcheting where people will say well we've got the passes here and everyone's using them why on earth aren't they used here and then how are you going to manage environments like say universities colleges um, you know, the expectation will be that everyone has this green tick, because if you need one just to go to your pub, then there will be the expectation amongst the people that are pushing for this stuff that you have it in all other ki kinds of environments. I mean, this is like the the slippery slope on steroids. But um, if you don't mind... Can I come back to that? Just to, it seems to me, Silky, you're kind of arguing both that people don't want this because it's dystopian and also that they do want it. And if you try and take it away, they'll feel they'll feel weird about it. And just to put some numbers behind that, there's a study by University of Bristol that looked into public um, views on the use of health passes. And it found that only 20 percent of the people they surveyed were strongly opposed and 60 percent said they would want for them one for themselves. So they could prove their health status. Yeah, so I think yeah. there's a bit more public acceptance of this kind of thing than um, some people might think. It depends what you mean when I was talking about they, and I actually meant people who are like yourself who who are advocating for this, not necessarily the, the, the general public. And um, I have also looked at studies about uh, public views towards this. It's not the be all and end all. I mean, I'm a human rights advocate at the end of the day, um, you know, more important to me than, than populism. Um, but often the way that these questions are framed um, are as this kind of authoritarian ultimatum. Um, if it could release you from lockdown, would you go out with this um, app or uh, would you accept these kinds of checkpoints? And in those circumstances, then, then of course, some people are coerced into saying yes, but that's not a free choice. There's been, let's be honest, there's been nothing, there's been, there's been nothing democratic about this. Um, you know, the, 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 there, there has been no um, public input in, in, into any of this decision making. Has, has it disappointed you that there hasn't been more support for civil liberties? I mean, have you been waiting for this moment when the kind of great sleeping English lion was going to wake up and say enough is enough? Because that moment hasn't really happened. I place my bets on the public, on the rationality of the public. If I didn't do that, then what would be the point of me waking up every morning and doing my job? Um, We've been through a really rocky period over the past year, and we have seen a huge loss of civil liberties. Um, but I was a civil liberties advocate years before this, during different types of crises and, and situations. Um, you know, when we when we were fighting t t some of um, Tony Blair's authoritarian proposals um, that that made us a worse country as a result. Um, so, you know, we 
we've, we've been through a lot as a country over the last year, but unfortunately, I think we're at the beginning of something. I mean, proposals like this are really an example of that. That you know, there's a lot more to come. There's a lot more. There, there are lots more civil liberties battles that we have to fight. I think people will be prepared to use something for international travel if they have to, whether or not an evidence base is there for it or not. Enough. The critical thing is enough people won't use this domestically. If if domestic vaccine passport is introduced, there will be enough people who who would refuse to to use it, myself included, that will make this not viable. And to be fair, every process for social change in history has relied on a dedicated minority, not necessarily a majority. Kirsty, let's get a sense of, of your red lines. I mean, are there things that you would say are too far? You know, for example, what about children? Are you in favour of health passports for children? Good question. And in a way, that's already happening, right? So high school students are doing their lateral flow tests at home this week and presumably having to demonstrate the results of those to their teachers or to their schools when they go into school. So in a sense, that's that sort of Rubicon's already been crossed. And I think there's a question, a question in all of this is about proportionality. So if we're talking about a um, an easy to take step, taking a test and showing the result of that to meet to radically reduce the um, risk of transmission of COVID in a school environment. I think that's proportionate. I think that's justified. Babies? I think they're... I'm sorry, babies? Um, babies, I do have a baby myself and I've never tried to swab its nostrils, nor would I attempt that. I wouldn't recommend that to anybody. Right, so a red I mean, line. Red we, line. Found a, we found a red line then. That babies are going to be outside this system. Babies' nostrils are off limits. Right. Silky, do you have red lines? I mean, for example, a hospital ward, would you be comfortable saying that all visitors to a hospital ward need to show a health passport before they can come in? I think in health settings, there needs to be a serious evaluation um, around testing and, and vaccination. We probably don't have to reinvent the wheel here because there there is already um, at least an expectation that people working in certain health settings, not all, um, but in certain health healthcare um, roles, that they have vaccinations. To the best of my knowledge, that has never been mandatory before. And I think there's lots of reasons that that would be a worry. And I know that some of the healthcare worker unions are, are, are speaking about this and voicing concern about this as well. Um, people who are, who are really vulnerable to coronavirus are likely to be vulnerable to other things. So, like I say, I think there's some some precedent on this, and there has to be a really careful kind of um, evaluation in in those circumstances. But I don't think it's black and white. Is it not true that some doctors have to take some shots if they're um, surgeons, for example? Yeah, to, to the best of my knowledge, that's a um, a strong expectation, and obviously one that's widely followed. I mean, you're dealing with health. Um, experts, professionals. Kirsty, I've got a question for you, which actually comes from me, which is, this is something I genuinely don't understand. I thought the idea was we were supposed to take vaccinations until we reach a point of herd immunity. And at that point, it doesn't really matter if one or two people have the virus in a theatre or in a restaurant, because so many people will be immune that it won't get very far. So if there's an infected person in the stalls of your theatre, you can relax because everyone around them will be vaccinated. Why is no one talking about that? What, do, why do we need these vaccine passports? So I think people have in mind a kind of scenario where we get to this situation where it's all under control. Either everybody's vaccinated or enough of the population are vaccinated that it's not a problem. But there's no um, there's no kind of um, out, there's no out of the woods, unfortunately. While it's going to take us another couple of years, at least for everyone in the world to get vaccinated, there's still a risk of new variants cropping up that could come back in and could be more transmissible or could be more deadly. And so it's not under control anywhere until it's under control everywhere. And the other thing to say is, um, like Silky's pointed out, there's no absolutes in this. So having a vaccine reduces greatly your risk of getting ill or uh, dying of COVID, but it doesn't reduce, it doesn't completely eliminate it. Um, and it reduces your risk of passing it on, but it doesn't completely eliminate it. So having it circulating in the population completely unrestrained and um, developing new variants all the time is not a happy situation to be in. Let me, let me ask you both to kind of sum up, if I could, then. It feels like we've explored this quite well. Um, Kirsty, let's start with you since you were just um, finishing up. Imagine that you have a chorus, a big group of people in front of you who are really worried about this, um, because you probably do. 
Um, some of them may feel like there's some great conspiracy going on and you, you know you were part of this uh, global elite trying to foist on the Great Reset. Others may just feel hesitant that this is not the kind of world they want to go into. What would you say to them by way of reassurance? I would say that the technology already exists for us to do this in a way that is secure and is private and is lean and um, you know unintrusive. And if this if there is a tool that we can access that helps us to reduce the number of people that get sick and die from COVID, I think it would be foolhardy not to explore that tool. I think you know you can evoke visions of a dystopian um, kind of society as much as you want, but to me, a world where we never dare to make use of technology in case we get it wrong, that's a dark view of society that I don't want to see come to pass. Silky, let's have a final word from you. Having heard everything we've discussed today, uh, what are your big worries? Um, I mean, this isn't about being technophobic um, at all. Look how we're having this this conversation. Um, it's about being cautious about uh, moving into quite an ugly kind of divisive and segregated society. And worse still, doing that on unnecessary and unproven grounds. I still fail to understand why the Tony Blair Institute for Global Change is pushing this when the World Health Organization is not. I fail to understand why it's being pushed when there is still not conclusive evidence on transmissibility. Um, and I fail to understand why it's being pushed when we do now have really high vaccination uptake amongst the most vulnerable people and we should be we should be looking at liberalizing and, and opening things up again. I understand Kirsty's temptation to see this as a silver bullet solution and I understand always that there's a temptation to do that but I think the reality is a bit more complex. We're going to have to have a number of measures in place for some time but vaccination passports uh, are, are not one of them. Okay, Silky Carlo. And Kirstie Innes, thank you both so much. We had a totally different viewpoints there, but really well expressed. Uh, clearly, this is an issue that divides people very deeply. They feel very passionately about it. And hopefully this has shed some light on it. So thank you to both of you. This was Lockdown TV.